Now, what are we talking about here? What is Solomon saying? Well, number one, the commandment. Don't fail to discipline your children. Um, discipline. You know, I, I, there's so many things I wish I would have known when I was a new mom. Don't we all feel that way? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that my kids, yes. that my kids love the Lord and they love me. But I'll tell you what, I would have done a few things differently if I knew yeah. what I knew today. Yeah, yeah. But we can't go backwards. We can't go backwards. But 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 listen, those of you who have young children in your home, but I also want to say, especially if you're a grandparent, grandparents, you have a very unique, important role in the lives of your grandchildren. So if I'm speaking to someone who your children are out of your house, but you're a grandparent, please understand this goes for you too. This goes for you too. You can actually influence your grandchildren in a way that the parents can't. No joke. No joke. Verse 15, physical discipline may well save them from death. What is that? Here's your right in. Proper correction. It's not shaming. It's correction. You're correcting your child. Of a child can save them from an early death, which is true. Uh, discipline in your home can save them from an early death, whether they get uh, addicted on pills or or, or or never learn to work or never learn to respect authority. Let me tell you, if children never learn to respect authority in your home, they will never learn to respect authority in school, in college, or at a job. <laughs> which leads them then to do other things to get money to live, to eat. Okay, so, so it can do that. But here it is, certainly from the second death. The second, the first death is when we die here on earth. The second death is when we're spiritually dead. There's heaven, there's a hell. The, the, the second death is, is that, that day we stand before the Lord on judgment day. We got to understand that our correction today, our focus on training our child. Remember, we're not called to raise a child. We're called to train a child. The training of a child, you must connect the training of your children today to eternity. It, there's a direct line. We think, oh yeah, that's so far away. Well, not necessarily. Jesus will come and get us at any time. Are you, are you ready for the trumpet to sound? I am. But yes. we're going to be good and faithful servants until then, fruitful servants. But understand, there is a place for both literal physical correction of a child, such as spanking. Okay? I was spanked as a kid. I don't know about you. Were you guys oh, yeah. spanked on Facebook? Yeah. How about yeah. YouTube? Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. Were you That's spanked? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Yeah. I was spanked with a belt. Now, it, the Bible is clear that physical abuse is wrong. We never abuse children. There is no abuse allowed in the body of Christ anywhere. Well, it should be in the world, but unfortunately, there's so much abuse. And I have known of, of parents, Christian parents, who have gone over the line into abuse. Not okay, not okay, not okay. Physical abuse is never okay. Rachel, you're right. My mom used a wooden paddle and we would carve our names. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Maureen is so smart. I used a wooden spoon. Well, I used a belt when the little, littler and then a wooden spoon when they got a little bit older. I just felt it was a little bit more controllable. Anyway, the point is Solomon is saying, don't fail to discipline your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. This whole marshmallow world of just, oh, give them a timeout. Don't say anything harsh to them. You might injure their little feelings. No, you're creating a monster. Right. You're yeah. creating a monster yeah. that is going to be out of control. Yeah. And the next thing is going to happen is you're going to go, oh, I'm out of control. My kid's out of control. The teachers say they're out of control. And then they're going to throw them on drugs. And yeah. then they're going to zone out. And then those drugs are going to lead to, uh, listen, it's a very slippery slope. Please correct your children. Correct your children. Solomon says it may well save them from death. It could be a literal death here on earth, but for sure you're saving them from the second death, which is heaven and hell. All right. So if you love your kids, you got, you've got to, uh, you've got to correct them. Now, let me just say it again, that nowhere is there any allowance for brutalizing or abusing kids. And I mean, not just physically, but verbally. Verbal abuse can sometimes have longer effects than physical abuse. Those words spoken, words of anger, words of you are, you'll never, you know, words of you, oh my gosh, they're horrible. 
So please, mom or dad, whoever's watching this, if you're in any kind of situation where there's physical or verbal abuse, you've got to get help. You need to go to a pastor. You need to go to a Christian counselor. I mean, today. I mean, when I mean, turn off this broadcast and pick up the phone, call your pastor, call an agency, call a Christian counselor, get help because you must love those children. You must love yourself if you're a woman or a man who's being abused physically or verbally. We always think that it's men that do this to women. There's many women who do this to men. It's not okay. We are Christians because of love. We must be kind and tender hearted and compassionate and caring. These are the fruits of the spirit. The fruits of the devil are accusing, anger, rage, uh, um, demeaning. Okay. So just look at what's going on. What world are we dealing with? But get help. <laughs> Do not say stuck or it's your fault. You're, you're being complicit to the crime. Hey, hey, hey. If you stay in a situation that is dangerous, you're being complicit. You might not have been the person that right. Hey, in, in, in the in courtrooms all over America today, there will be people that will go to prison, not because they committed the crime, because they stood back and watched it happen. If you are standing back and watching it happen, you are complicit to a crime. And it's not okay. So buck up, get help, suck up your pride, suck up your, suck up your, your weak. Uh, I don't want people to know because you might be saving somebody's life and certainly somebody's spiritual life. And it's very, very prevalent today. I know it's prevalent in the world, but it's also prevalent in Christian homes and it's not okay. It's just not okay. So who's going to fix it? You are, you're the one listening to this right now. Get help. Get help. Reach out. Get to the authorities if you have to. All right, here we go. Next verse. 15 and 16 together. My child, if your heart is wise, my own heart will rejoice. Everything in me will celebrate when you speak what is right. Oh, now we have the heart of a parent. Here's your next writing. Here Solomon, a parent, reflects on the great happiness he would have if his children actually received and lived in this wisdom. Isn't that great? And don't we know that? Look at here. Hey guys, I just want to say this. If you're not getting your notes, put your email here. Every, every week I create notes and my producer Liz will send you these notes. If you are watching this on YouTube or Facebook and you would like to receive notes by email every Tuesday morning, just put your email right here and, and Liz will be happy to give you the notes, send you the notes. Because I want you to be able to teach this. I want you to be able to refer back to it. I absolutely do. When the father hears his child's lips speak right things, he has reason to believe that the lessons of wisdom have been learned. When we hear our children, and some, some of us who have a little older children, now and then you hear those things that you used to say come out of their mouth and you kind of privately have a little party <laughs> outwardly, outwardly, you don't go, Oh my gosh, you just said no. But inside you go, Oh wow. I think I got it. There's wisdom coming out. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes that's right. We didn't think yeah. they were listening, but they were listening. So thank God for that. That's really good. Verse 17 yeah. and 18. Don't envy sinners. Envy means to be jealous of or want what they have. Right. Don't want what sinners have, but always continue to fear the Lord. You will be rewarded for this. Your hope will not be disappointed. Friends, when you live by faith, God's going to reward you. God's going to reward you here on earth and certainly in heaven when you receive your reward. So just remember that every decision you make today, right or wrong, truth or the lie, every right decision you make, every right, every time you overcome that temptation that, that, that the enemy puts in front of you, that you put in front of you, every time you win, God's going to reward that. I just find such comfort in that. Remember now our culture, our culture rewards and exalts and promotes sinning and evil, right? Yeah. They promote it. 
multi billions of dollars every year in advertising for promoting right. evil from promoting i mean take one trip to las vegas every single mm -hmm. taxi cab every single bulletin board they call it sin city mm -hmm. i mean on the strip it is there's wonderful christian yeah. people who live there there's actually really great churches there mm -hmm. but but on the strip it's all about come on sin drink yeah. get drunk gamble uh mm -hmm. get prost get a prostitute i mean you can't walk into a restaurant without somebody handing you uh you know down the street. You yeah. can't walk anywhere without somebody handing you a slip of paper. Hey, call Susie for a good time. I mean, it, the world promotes evil. Movie stars, athletes, business tycoons, world politicians, rich and famous sinners are pushed at you every single day. I was just, you know, I was waiting. I was waiting for someone yesterday. I was just sitting in the car and I was waiting. And so I was just sitting around on Facebook and just doing nothing for a few minutes. And I, there were these articles, you know, I don't care if it's the Kardashians or whatever. It was such trivial. I actually, I looked at it and I started reading whatever some who's pregnant or somebody thinks somebody's pregnant. And I'm like, who cares? And I was mad at myself for even being drawn into that conversation. Was it? And I just, I turned it off and I turned on, I turned, I turned, I went on my Bible app and just started playing the Bible app. I'm like, this is ridiculous. But you see, we get drawn in, we get drawn into these stories. We get drawn into this crud on TV, on the internet, on, on the rate everywhere. Now we got to become, we got to become strong in the Lord. Remember the helmet of salvation isn't just to be saved. It's to protect your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Salvation is more than just becoming born again. It's saving your mind. It's saving your, your behavior. It's saving your thought life. That helmet is a protection. That's why we must put on the armor of God every day. Today is July 2nd. Have you put the armor of God on? Have you gotten dressed up in those things? I think it would be a good thing to do. Let's do it right now. I'm going to just pause. I'm going to, I'm going to flip over to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 is where you find this every day. And let's just, pr let's just pray this over ourselves. We're going to walk through this. I just feel, in, I feel the anointing to do that. Um, sometimes you got to just stop and, and work it out, right? Oh, <laughs> mm. Hey, I did this a couple few days ago. Some, I had somebody in my car that I'm kind of mentoring, coaching, somebody I'm discipling. Let's put it that way. And we were talking about a certain situation. I just want to show you. I'm just, my mind works like this. I'm jumping all over the place. We're going to actually do something because I was talking about it, but now I'm going to illustrate it. So now it's leading me to think about a few days ago, had someone in my car, somebody I'm discipling, and we were talking about a situation. And this person was telling me, well, I'm just not sure what to do. And I kind of confused. And I said, okay, stop. And actually, as soon as I said, stop, the Holy Spirit told me to pull the car over and I pulled the car over and I said, now I'm going to illustrate to you what I'm talking about. If you don't, if you're supposed or you're supposed to go right, stop, ask for directions, talk to Siri, make a text. Hey, was I supposed to go right at the, at the grocery store? Was I supposed to go left? What's stupid and foolish is to just keep going when you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Are you following me? Yeah. Yeah. Now, what does this mean in the spiritual? If you don't know what to do, the worst thing you can do is just keep wandering aimlessly. What you need to do is stop and ask mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Spend extra time in prayer. Stop. Yeah. Don't keep in motion. Stop your vehicle. What is the vehicle? That's you. Stop what you're doing. Take a lunch break. Go sit in your car. Sit in your garage if you have to before you go into the chaos at the kitchen. Have you ever done that before, girls? Oh, yeah. Um, guys can do it too. <laughs> I remember sometimes because the moment you walk in your house, what is it? Mom, mom, got to get it. Got the bills, mm -hmm. got the groceries, got the trash, mm -hmm. got the dirty clothes, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a war zone. And I remember somebody smart telling me sometimes, Londa, 
You walk in to your home with victory. You don't walk in chaotic. Yeah. Walk in with victory. Well, what if you don't have the victory? Then sit in your car until you get it. Yeah. yeah. Sit in your car. Get your mind right. Get your attitude right. Yeah. Don't walk in all, oh, 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 I'm just so busy. All chaotic like a tornado. You're bringing that tornado to everybody else in your home. Come on, you guys. You bring peace with you. If you're filled with the presence of God, you're bringing that shalom peace with you. You come to settle the storm. You don't come to bring the storm. Do you see the maturity in that? So I remember sometimes I would just sit in the garage. Okay, Lord. I would talk to God. Lord, when I walk in here, I know it's going to be a couple hours of just serving everybody else. Lord, I need you to fill me up right now because I'm feeling kind of empty. I'm feeling kind of trashed. I'm feeling kind of, whew. And I would just focus my mind. I still do this. I do this sometimes before I come to church. Because when I, when I walk into a room, I want to have the Holy Spirit filling me, not Londa filling me. I want to be peaceful. I want to bring joy. I want to have a smile on my face. Mm-hmm. And so if you got to stop and get the victory before you bring that confusion to somebody else, are you following me? Mm-hmm. Is this help anybody? Mm-hmm. Pull it back. Pull it back. Pump the brakes. Slow down. Get the victory. Don't walk into a room with your hair on fire. Because all you're going to do is set everybody else on fire. Right. You walk in the room with a fire extinguisher. Yeah. Hey, 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 everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Hey, how was your day today? You walk in filled with the love of Jesus, with the presence of Jesus. You walk in to bring peace and comfort. You walk in to bring the, bring heaven to earth, mm-hmm. not hell to your house. Right. But somebody needs to hear this today. Now let's practice again. Ephesians 6, let's do it. Let's do it right now, everybody. I want you to do this. As we are walking through it, here we go. Finally, my brother, I'm in verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's for you today. That's for you today, Clara. That's for you today, Jim. Hi, sweetie. Put on the whole armor. How much of the armor? Oh. Yep. Don't go out naked. You might have a hat on your head, but be butt na- buck naked. <laughs> and the cops are going to, uh, cops are going to start, the spiritual cops are going to stop you for going out of the house naked. Hey. Don't go out naked. Put on the whole armor of God. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Reject the lie that your enemy is a person. It's not. You you have one enemy and his name is Satan, Lucifer, the devil. It's the spirit driving people. It's not the people you're at war with. It's the spirit driving them. You got to, you got to deal with spiritual things in a spiritual way. Many of you are stressed out because you're trying to deal with spiritual things in a natural way. You're trying to get them to understand. No, the devil is not interested in you getting them to understand. Stop trying to talk your way into reason. You're just going to get plummeted by by the evil one. Don't do that. you got to deal with spiritual things in a spiritual way. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Your actual battle is in four different areas. That's a whole different message. I can teach on those four different things. They're all different. They're not one. Now, here it is. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Do you guys want to withstand in the evil day? Do you want to withstand? Then you've got to do this every single day. Every single day you renew it. You never take off the armor of God. But every single day, again, you refresh yourself. Thank you, Lord. Now, we're going to do it right now. And I'm going to do it in the form of a prayer. All right. So as I walk through these things, I want you to do it. If I say helmet, put your head head on your hand. If I say belt of truth, put it around your waist. If I say feet, reach down and touch your feet. Okay. I want you to do that. If I say breastplate, put your hand over your chest. Here we go. Oh, stand there for heavenly father. I come to you in Jesus name. Now I'm praying the spiritual warfare prayer. So, so walk this through with me. Just agree. Just say amen. in your spirit, as I pray this over you and me, father in heaven today, we receive your charge to be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might.
Today, God, I might feel weak in myself, but I am strong because of you, because of your strength and your might. And today I choose to put on the whole armor of God again. I never took it off last night, but today again, July 2nd, 2019, I am marching through these things again because God, I know that my fight today is not with people. It's against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness and spiritual hosts of wickedness. So today, God, I take up, I take up, come on, just grab it. Just like with your hand, just grab it. I take up the whole armor of God that I might be able to withstand in the evil day. And surely today is an evil day in our culture, in our nation. God, righteousness seems to be so far away from so many, but God, I stand in your truth. So today, according to verse 14 of Ephesians 6, God, I stand having girded my waist with truth. Put your hand on your waist. God, I waste, I gird my inner self, my inner, my core. In the exercise world, they call it your core. God, we gird up, we pull together our spirit, our mind, our thoughts with truth. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life according to John 14, 6. I pull together everything that seems loose with the truth of God. We gird it up. We put on the belt of truth. And then, Lord, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. God, we get dressed in your righteousness. God, we are dressed in your robe of righteousness. You do not see our sin. When we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, according to John, 1 John 1, 9. Thank you, Lord, that, that our righteousness is you, Lord. I stand before you and I march forward in this battle, knowing that those arrows will not hit this breastplate. Because you, they got to get through you first and no enemy is ever going to get through <laughs> you, God. Thank you, Lord, that we, we put that breastplate on. And next, God, we shot our feet, meaning we, we put on our feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. Everywhere we walk today, everywhere I walk today, I will bring peace. Do you see how this connects with what I was just saying? I shod my feet. I put on where my feet go, whether it's to the grocery store, to my office, to a meeting with my boss, to my bedroom, to my bathroom. Everywhere I walk, I'm going to bring the gospel. What is the gospel? That Jesus, that Jesus lived. He died. He rose again. The peace of God. I bring with me the gospel of what? peace. I will bring it with me everywhere I walk today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And according to verse 16, I take the shield of faith, the shield of faith. This is why we're living by faith. I take it in my hand and I push that forward. That faith shield is where we will be able to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that every dart of the haters, of the accusers, of the evil one against me and my family will be thwarted, will fall to the ground because I live by faith, not by sight. I refuse to look at the arrows flying. What I'm going to see is that shield of faith in front of me today. And into verse 17, I put on the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. God, you have saved me. You've delivered me. And God, that helmet is not just to be born again. That helmet is to protect my thoughts. Today, I take every thought captive and I bring it to the submission of Christ. Every thought, only things of good, not evil. That we will think, Lord, according to Philippians 4, 8, on what is true, what is right, what is noble, what is good, what is lovely, what is of a good report. These are the things we'll think about. Every other thought must be struck down in Jesus' name. Thank you, God, the helmet of salvation. And now the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Put your hand on your Bible. We put the word of God in our mouth. I put the word of God in my mouth today. I put the word of God in my hand today. I put the word of God in my heart today. I put the word of God in my thoughts today. And because of this, this is our offensive weapon with prayer, with prayer, praying always. The next verse 18, the two offensive weapons are the word and prayer, the word and prayer today. I will be watchful. Where's the enemy trying to get to me? I will be watchful and awake. 
Where is he trying to get to me? Is he trying to get to me through my kids, through my spouse, through my boss, through a friend? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to allow that in Jesus' name. I live with the armor of God on. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am more than victorious because of the name and the blood of Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, guys, is that that's an example of how to pray the armor of God. Are you following me? Yes. This is what we do now. So this is how we handle this. This is how we handle this. We've got to get smart at the tricks of the devil. We've got to get smart so that we don't fall for his ploys. We don't fall for his ploys for here again. We're in Proverbs 23. If you're just joining us, we're in Proverbs 23, verses 17 and 18. Don't envy sinners, but always continue to fear the Lord. Always live in that armor of God. He's going to reward us when we do that. Now, let's go to verse 17 and 18. We're marching through verse uh, Proverbs 23. Here we go. It's an easy trap. Here it is. Um, hold on a minute. I am missing this. Oh, no, no, no. I'm still back at 17 and 18. It's an easy trap for some to be jealous of what sinners have or what sin sinners do. Have you ever thought, I I'm just going to, I'm going to confess to you. There are some times I go, wow, it'd be great to sleep in on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sinners don't worry about getting up and going to church and getting their kids dressed and getting everybody fed and getting, yes. you know. But I have those thoughts sometimes. I have those thoughts that, wow, it'd be great to just be able to walk away from your responsibilities. I mean, I mean, not all, not all sinners walk away from their responsibilities, but here's my point. It's an easy trap to look at those maybe that have money unscrupulously or just have money to be jealous of those that have funds, right? Whether they got them in a good way or a bad way. It would be easy to be jealous of that and go, oh, if I only had that, then I could be happy. Don't let yourself fall in that trap of if I, then I would. Right. Don't let yourself fall in the trap. Be content. Paul said, I'm content whatever state I'm in. Right. Be happy with what God's blessed you with. Be a good steward of what God's blessed you with. I don't care if you make $100 a month. You tie the first 10 bucks to God because he's never going to bless you. He will not be. He cannot bless you if you rob him. It's about a discipline. You tithe the first 10%. God will begin to pour out his blessings on you when you obey him. He doesn't like to be robbed. Who likes to be robbed, right? Mm -hmm. Verse. Here we go. Verses. Uh, here's another thing. We are wise to embrace a constant eternal perspective. Why should we not be jealous of those who sin or, or envy them? Because we need to have an eternal perspective. Hey, mm -hmm. they might get their reward here on earth. I'm going to get my reward for all eternity. Make sense? Live with an eternal perspective. That's why I'm an evangelist. I live knowing that people, if they don't hear about Jesus, they will be, they, that, that's on me. I, I've got to do everything I can to help share the gospel. And if you aren't called to be an evangelist as a, as a, as a, uh, as a profession, I am. But if that's not your profession, you might be a nurse, you might be a caregiver, you might be a homekeeper, you might be a, a day be an entrepreneur, you might be a business owner. Then you're called to give and to serve in your church home who does support evangelism and missions. But every member is a minister, every member plugged into their area of ministry, plugged in, serving at their church that, that has the overall goal of going and making disciples. Are you following me? Yeah. But we're all to be a mouthpiece for Jesus. Yeah. We don't just leave that to the pastor or the missionary. We all, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods, everybody is called to be a minister, a missionary, an agent, a representative, whatever word rings your bell. That's who you are, Jesus says. I've called you and chosen you. God, God goes, come on, help me out here. Verse 19, my child, listen and be wise. Keep your heart on the right course. Do you see a theme here with Solomon in, in Proverbs 23? This is a dad longing for his children to, to, to follow in the way of the Lord. Isn't that the heart of every parent? Longing for your children to follow in the way of the Lord. Here it is. Not listening is a sign of immaturity. Have you ever tried to talk to your spouse and they're nodding at you like they're listening, but they're really not? Huh? God doesn't want us. God doesn't want us a sign of immaturity. Because it says, my child, listen and be wise. 
So, so what is the opposite of that? Did I miss one? No. Oh, not listening is a sign of immaturity. Let, let me, let me be clear. If the Bible says, listen and be wise, here's what that also means. Don't listen and be a fool. That's right. If you don't listen, you're going to be a fool. Yeah. If you don't listen to my message on Sundays, you can listen, but be tuned out and thinking about yeah. something else. Well, you're not being wise. Mm -hmm. If you don't listen to your boss's instructions, you're, you're going to be a fool mm -hmm. and you're going to get fired. Be wise, follow instructions, listen. So don't be immature. God wants us to grow up and be immature. Here we are. We are responsible to keep our heart on the right course. This is what this verse is saying. Let me read it again. Keep your heart on the right course. There it is. Mm -hmm. Keep your heart. Who's supposed to keep your heart on the right course? Huh? Me. You. Whose responsibility is it? Is it your husband or your wife or your mm -hmm. preacher? No, it's your job to keep your heart on the right course. So own it. Don't blame somebody or something else for your immaturity. It's your job to listen. It's your job to grow up. It's your job to be wise. It's your job to live by faith. Keep it on the right course. Amen. The Lord will help you. Verse 20 and 21. Do not carouse with drunkards or feast with gluttons. For they are on their way to poverty and too much sleep clothes them in rags. This is speaking to this. The drunkard and the glutton represent the epitome of the lack of discipline. Discipline. Lack of discipline or people who want to sleep all day. You might have a sleeping problem. I mean, you might need to go to a sleep clinic and get help. Because that's real. However... I'm not talking about a natural, I'm talking about a spiritual spirit of slumber. There are people who have a spirit of slumber that all they want to do is sleep. That's not okay. It's a sign of lack of discipline. People that are always tired, no. Fix your, put, put, put the fuel. What are you putting in your body? You're putting junk in your body. You're going to feel like junk and want to sleep all the time. If you, if you're not, if you're not taking care of yourself, so drunkards and gluttons, what happens when you eat at, after Thanksgiving? Tell me here, let me just talk about me. What happens to Londa Ramsey after I eat a huge meal on Thanksgiving or Christmas or any other week that tryptophan, is that what it's called? Tryptophan kicks in and everybody wants to go take a nap. Well, so this is what this is why the the Bible uh, instructs us against gluttony. Don't eat yeah. too much, because if you eat too much, you're going to be sleepy. And if you're sleepy, you're not going to be sharp. You're not going to make good decisions. So, so just be disciplined, okay? And it says the Bible says here they're on their way to poverty. In other words, too much sleep clothes them in rags. They're not working hard. God likes hard workers. He likes yeah. us to work hard. The point is, all of these things come from God, but. Like everything, too much of anything becomes a sin, right? Too much of anything can lead us into a place of idolatry, a place of too much focus or distraction. You know, the Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And even in the New Testament, the Lord must come first. So anything that comes first, that could be hunting, that could be shopping. I know people who literally shop till they dry something. Oh, I don't like it. I return it. Do you know how much time is wasted by doing that? Do you know how much time is wasted by buying stuff you don't need? But some people just get a thrill from just sliding that card. Come on, here's my chip. I got it. Insert. Come on. You're on your way to poverty. Be disciplined in every area of your life. Verse 22. Verse 22, or we're in Proverbs 23 if you're just joining. Hello, Linda from Niswa. How are you doing, sweetheart? You're way up north. Good for you. Uh, verse 22 says, listen to your father who gave you life and don't despise your mother when she is old. Listen, listen to your father who gave you life and don't despise your mother when she is old. Here's your right. And God handpicked our parents for us. It does grieve me when I hear people say, oh, I was born into the wrong family. I mean, what? I understand. Now, remember, not everybody has a great experience in their home. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. So here's my next right in God's plan. And here's the key. God's plan is that an uncircle that godly parents train 
godly children who will respect and honor them when they are old. That's God's plan. God's plan is that God, godly parents train godly children. I had that privilege. I had godly parents that were not perfect, but they did Praise train God. us. Oh, Amen. Yeah. But many yeah. didn't. And if, you, if I'm talking to you today and you did not have godly parents, remember that's not God's fault. It's not God's fault that those parents didn't follow God. It's, it's on them. It's not on God. Does that make sense? Right. Because everyone has a choice. Everyone has a choice. Maybe they were not raised by godly parents. And maybe you're the product of generational curses that have just been rolling down. But here's the good news. You can change it for the rest of the generations. No matter what was handed to you, you can become the godly parent. Praise God. You can be free. You can get healing. You can get deliverance. You can be set free from those ugly patterns of from before. But remember that um, fundamentally, God handpicked you to be born. There's no accident you were born to the parents you were born to. God doesn't make accidents. He doesn't make mistakes. So thank God. If you can't thank God for anything else, thank God that he used your dad and your mom to give you life. If that's all you can thank them for, thank God for that. Even if they were horrible parents, you can at least thank God Thank you, God, that you, they gave me life. They gave me birth, right? And you can rejoice in that if you can't go any farther. You make, make sense? Amen. Verse 23, get the truth and never sell it. Also get wisdom, discipline, and good judgment. Now, there are two gets. Here's my point. Who is supposed to go get it? We are. We are to get the truth. That's why you're watching this today. To live by faith. You're here to get truth. You're here to be changed. You're here to grow in God. Amen. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. That shows a proactive, I'm leaning in. I'm going to get smarter. I'm going to grow up in God. I love that. Thank you for that. I just want you to know this isn't any other body, anyone else's responsibility but yours. Get the truth and never let go of it. Meaning sell it. Don't, don't ever get rid of it. Don't ever let it be taken from your hand. Let it, let it, you know, Esau sold his, 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 his right for a bowl of soup, bowl of stew. He sold his birthright. Never sell it. I don't care what somebody bribes you with. If you'll do this, I'll give you this. Don't ever let go of it. No. This is precious. The most precious thing we have is our salvation, is our truth of who Jesus is. So here it is. Guard and protect truth as a great treasure. I have a question. What is the most precious thing you own? The most precious. Is it your parents' Bible? Is it a mother's wedding ring? Is it, is it, what is the most precious treasure that you have in your possession? In your possession? Yeah, besides besides your salvation and besides your kids or your spouse. Because you can't really choose you can't you don't own them. Yeah. I'm just asking you to think about I'm just asking you to think about what that might be. You know, you maybe inherited something or you maybe had something given to you that's very precious to me. I know for me your mom's wedding ring. Okay. Your mom Faith's wedding ring is in your possession. Yeah. Now I'll bet yeah. you anything, Liz, that you guard that. Yeah. You know where it is at all yeah. times. You don't let that thing roll around in your car, roll around yeah. in your house. You yeah. guard it. You protect it. You mm -hmm. might even lock it up in a safe. Yeah. Right. Nobody can get to it. Okay. This is how much we are to protect and guard truth. Now, let me use a different context for this verse. Get the truth and never sell it. Get wisdom, discipline, and good judgment. Okay, let me use a different analogy. Let's talk about gossip. Let's say somebody tells you something. Let's, tell, let's say somebody tells you something about somebody else. What are you going to do with that? Number one, number one, yeah. if it's gossip, you can't even listen to it. Because yeah, right. if you listen to the gossip, you're being complicit to the sin. I'm going to say it again. If you listen to the gossip, you're being complicit to the sin. Because you're, you're standing back and letting another person sin by gossiping about somebody else. Don't do it. 
But when you know the truth, truth is what? When you're a living witness, I was there. Okay, today I'm sitting here in Burnsville, Minnesota. I see the people around this table. Now, if somebody comes to me Thursday and says, you know, you know, when John was at Living by Faith on Tuesday, I'll go, John wasn't at Living Faith by Tuesday. That's the truth. You know why? Because I was there. I saw it. I tasted it. I touched it. I was there. I was present. I'm a living witness. That's the opposite of that is what the Bible means when it says, don't be a false witness. If you are not present to see it, touch it, feel it, you have no comment on it. When the Bible says, don't be a false, don't bear a false witness. That means don't you dare even comment about something or someone if you didn't physically see it, experience it yourself. Now, here's what I'm saying. Get the truth and never sell it. Guard it. Guard it. Guard the truth. What is the truth? This is why in the natural realm, we have court systems. We have a judge where both parties come in. Hey, this is what happened. No, this party says this is what happened. And the judge has to weed through the evidence. The judge has to weed through the stuff to go, what really is the truth? In, in the spiritual realm, in the government of God, we rule differently. The Bible says in Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. It, and, and, and if that other person confesses their sin, admits and confesses it, then you've won that person back. You go privately to that person. If that person won't hear you in that setting, you go to the next stage, which is you bring other leaders or elders or board members in with you and you bring that person in. There's a government of God and there's a government of the world. Trust me, they're not the same. The Bible tells us not to deal with spiritual things in the in the natural government. We're to deal with things in the house of God in the house of God only. Are you following me? Mm-hmm. Yes. But I'm just telling you now about guarding the truth because this week, here it is Tuesday, this week you may hear things or be drawn into conversations that have nothing to do with you. Can I ask you to please love yourself enough not to let unwanted information in your mind? Love yourself. Do you want to be filled with all that crap? You got to examine yourself. If you like all of that drama, you need to look at your own heart because that means you're drawn to want to know. Hey, guard the truth. I am an expert on what? On me. I'm an expert on God and me. I'm an expert on the things that I see. I'm a real true witness on the things that I'm a part of, that I see, that I experience, that I witness. Only then is that truth. The rest is being a false witness. Are you hearing me? And we don't get to hear it or comment on it. What is it that that Ever. Choice. Um well, Tinsley said, but then I also heard it from um, Furtick when he was preaching one day. He says, when somebody says something, what does that have to do with me? Just to be like, I don't know. I don't need to hear it. But what does that have to do with me? Well, you remember, know? you're going to yeah. think about something. Good mm-hmm. point. What does that have yeah. to do with me? You're going to think about something. Yeah. And Pastor Joyce had great wisdom. Remember a few weeks ago when Pastor Joyce said, when somebody yeah, share, that share that with me. Yeah. Why do I need to know? Oh, why do I need to know this? Yeah. Yeah. Why do I need yes. to know this? Or yes. why do you need? In other words, yeah. put it on exactly. them. Like, why are you telling me this? Like, yeah. this is not, I'm not a part of the story. I'm not a part of right. fixing it. I wasn't there. Why would you fill my mind? I tell, I teach my team because I have a wonderful team here. I have a dream team of staff and volunteers, but I teach them, do not share with me unnecessary information. Land the plane. Give me the high level stuff. Give me the bullet points. Do not fill my mind with unwanted stuff. I got too much going on that I need to focus on. Amen. Don't yeah. be telling me the little tiny minutia details. Give me the bullet points, right? Yeah. Keep it and land the plane. Don't take 10 minutes to tell me a 30 second story. <laughs> right? Yeah, right? Storyteller. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but here's my point. Guard and protect truth is a great treasure. Seek a mentor, read books, get smart, get smart, get, get a, get someone smarter than you. If you're the smartest person in the room, you got to find a new room. Yeah. 
this is a scripture to Matthew 6, 21. It says, for where, Read it loud. Treasure, where, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Amen. Yeah. Where your treasure is. Mm -hmm. So if you're treasuring truth, that's where your heart's going to be with truth. Yes. That's a great scripture. Thank you very much. Verse 24. The father of godly children has cause for joy. Here we bar are back at parenting again. The father of godly children has cause for joy. What a pleasure to have children who are wise. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Lord. How can a father be happy? The answer is simple. If the son is righteous and wise. How can a father or a mother be grieved? The answer is just as simple. If that child is foolish and wicked. So here's your right in being righteous and wise. Not only pleases your earthly father and mother, but it pleases the God of heaven, your creator. For that is his commandment for your life. I want you and I to think about being wise. Think about being wise, not just to please your earthly, heavenly, earthly father and mother. We should do that. I always wanted to please my mother and father. I didn't a lot of times, but as I grew older, I sure wish to. You want to please your earthly mother and father, but how much more do we want to please the God of heaven, your creator? That is his commandment for us. Now, I'm going to read two verses. You can write these down by your notes. Ecclesiastes 12.1 and Ecclesiastes 12.13 and 14. You can study these later. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1 and Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. I'm going to read them for you. Verse 1 says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old. Wow. This is what we desire for our kids, right? For ourselves. Verse 13 and 14 says this. Fear God and obey his commands. For this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. God will judge us for everything we do. So this is why we have to live very close to the heart of God. Is, about, is this thing I'm about to say, is this thing I'm about to do going to glorify God or not? Praise the Lord. So we want to please the Lord. Verse 25 says this. This is a really cool thought. I'm going to get ready to share with you now. Give your mother and give your father and mother joy. What are we supposed to give our mother and father? Joy. joy. May she who gave you birth be happy. Now, think about this. May she who give you birth be happy. Not grieving. Not crying at night. Not up wondering where they are. Not not up worried about them, okay? So give your mother and father joy. This is a commandment. Now, here's your right, and I want you to see it this way. This truth has a 360-degree implication and application. It has a 360 degrees. 360, of course, is a circle. Now, let's look at this. We all have a father and mother, and many of us are a father and mother, Right? I'm looking at you, my friend, Kathy. Your mother's still living. Your father just went to heaven. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you're also a mother of a son and a daughter. Yep. So there's a 360-degree implication of this verse. Here it is. Up is a command to obey. Give your father and mother joy. That's an up. If your mother and father are alive on this earth, this is a commandment. Give them joy. Make them happy. Bless them. Yes. Visit them. Don't leave them alone to rot in some home somewhere. Shame on us. America, the United States is only one, one of the very few places in the world in every other culture in Asia, Japan, China, even in this Hispanic culture that those little elderly parents are brought into the home with another kid and, and, and caring for them. Be caring for them. It, our world is so, in, you know, if, you, if they're inconvenienced, well, let's just shuttle them off somewhere. I'm just, now there are times when that's necessary. Here, don't hear what I'm not saying. Mm -hmm. There are times when they need medical care to the degree mm -hmm. that you cannot physically mm -hmm. care for them. So please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm talking about, I know many friends who work in nursing homes. I have many friends mm -hmm. and nurses and caregivers who do home care that will tell me, on a regular basis that they have people they care for who have living sons and daughters within close driving distance that I say maybe visit them once or twice a year. That is an atrocity. Not okay. And sometimes never. It breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. It's not okay that we treat 
our elderly. And this is where our government is getting goofy. Trust me. With abortion, we're killing off the young. With euthanasia, they're not necessary anymore. That, that That's coming. Where, where they're not productive to society. That's the socialist government. If they're not productive to society, if they're <laughs> disabled in any way, if they're intellectually impaired or, or in a way that they can't serve the greater good, we're going to just kill them. What a horrible mark on our culture. So we got to bring this back. We got to bring this back up as a commandment to obey, right? So what are we supposed to do to our father and mother? We're supposed to bring them joy. 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 Everybody say joy. That is our oh, commandment to obey. Now, down, what does down mean? That means we gave them birth. Fathers or mothers. Down is a promise to pray. How do you pray this promise? Father in heaven, I thank you according to Proverbs 23, 25, that my children will give their dad and I joy, that my children will make good decisions, that my children will become wise. God, use, bring angels in their life, wake them up at night, send them dreams, send them visions, send them whatever it takes, send help from the sanctuary. God, bring them a friend so that they will embrace the truth of who God is so that their dad and I can be happy. Do you see how you pray that? Yes. So let me say this again. I got goosebumps when the Holy Spirit yeah. gave me this last night in study. Up is a command to obey. For our children, maybe all of your children are bringing you great joy. Praise God. You are probably the exception, not the rule. Usually if you've got a lot of kids, if you've got a lot of kids, there's some kid that you're praying for more than the other. There's somebody that you're just propping up with prayer, right? So here it is. Down is a promise to pray. I thank you, Lord. This is a promise that my kids will bring me joy that my kids will be wise. You see that? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let's go to verse 26. Verse 26. Uh, oh, my son, give me your heart. Oh, can you feel the love in that statement? Oh, my son, this is Solomon speaking. May your eyes take delight in following my ways. In following my ways. It doesn't say follow God's ways. It says follow my ways. Why? Because Solomon at this time was following God. Remember, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. The apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Right here, Solomon is saying, son, give me your heart. May your eyes take delight in following my ways. Why? Because Solomon was following God's ways. Remember, you know, um, uh, here it is. I want you to write this in. Fathers, and this could go for mothers too. Live a bold and obedient life for God so that your children will follow your influence. When your kids are little, dads and moms, they're following you as you are following Christ or they're following you as you are not following Christ. Solomon here in Proverbs 23, verse 26 is saying, hey, dads, stand up. Great fathers, stand up. Let your sons see your confidence and your boldness. Ask for their hearts on the basis of having perfected your highest goal, which is following Christ. Dad and mom, the very best gift you can ever give your children is to follow God with all your heart. Their Bible before they see you reading yours. Amen. Don't tell them to pray their prayers at night until they first see you praying for them. Early on in my life, I remember hearing mom and dad pray for us kids, naming us by name, Londa, Lisa, LJ, Lance, naming us by name. I'd be asleep on the bus still sometimes, and I'd hear my mom and dad praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, praying over us, praying over our team, praying over the day. Do you understand the impact? Well, of course, man, that's worth following. Praise the Lord. So now here's my point. How does this apply to you? Oh, that's nice, Londa. You lived on a bus in this little fairy tale world. No, trust me, it wasn't that. What I want you to know is when you go to church, your kids know. Your kids are watching. They see if you post or like, hey, I was at church today. Wow, this was said, or this is a picture. Or, this is what was done. Here's my friends from church. Here's my friends from life group. You're still influencing your kids, even though they might not be living in your home. Do you understand? You're still yeah. following God. They're knowing moms in church. 
Mom's loving Jesus. Mom reads her Bible. Send them a scripture. Send them a text. I have a friend of mine, actually a relative of mine, that sends her son a a truth, a scriptural truth and encouragement at 7 o'clock every morning. Every single morning. Habit. What a cool habit. I have not got to that place of godliness yet, but I will tell you that very often, if I feel something or sense something, I will privately, not in a group message, but I'll send to Chase. I'll send to Connor. I'll send to Grace. Hey, I love you. I'm thinking about you today. I just want you to remember blah, blah, blah. God's got you. He's working everything out. Put him first. And I just, I love you, Mom. Hey, you're planting seed. You're planting seed. Keep planting seed. No farmer's ever going to get a harvest if you don't keep planting seed. Right. Keep planting seed. Keep planting seed. Don't get discouraged. Some years there's a washout. Some years there's a flood. Keep planting seed. Farmers don't stop ever being a farmer when one year they get blown out. They keep planting seed. They keep planting seed. Why? Because they know the law. You keep planting seed and there's going to be a harvest. There's going to be a harvest. That harvest might not be this day, this week, but that harvest is coming. Sure. Keep planting seed. Keep planting seed. Because, But this is what a verse. Live a life. Here's my encouragement to you all today on, on YouTube and on Facebook. Live a life that others will go, I want to follow that. First your children and then your friends and then other people. Amen. Verse 27. Now we're coming to the close. We just have a few more minutes. Verse um Verses 27 and 28. Um, this is Solomon warning his son of what was a danger then, and it's still a danger today. A prostitute is a dangerous trap. A promiscuous woman is as dangerous as falling into a narrow well. She hides and waits like a robber, eager to make more men unfaithful. We are wise to keep a close guard. Here's your right end. We're wise to keep a close guard on our hearts and eyes to save us from sexual destroyers. Sexual destroyers. Today, this is even more prevalent than it was then. Why? In the day of Solomon, they didn't have something simple that they held in their hand called the internet. Pornography used to be a destroyer. It's even more of a destroyer. It was then and it is even more now. Why? Because you used to have to go get on the big computer in the main family room. Now you can hide in your bathroom or your bedroom or under your covers and you pump it in. And by the way, folks, porn is not just a male matter anymore. It is also a female. Can I give you some shocking statistics? 33% of women ages 13 to 24 seek out porn at least once a month. 33% of women ages 13 to 24. This is global, not just Christian or non-Christian, global. And there's a study done by a reputable source. I can give it to you if you want me to find it for you. That says that 68% of men in church watch porn regularly. Oh, Could this be sensational rhetoric? Not according to this national survey among churches. The survey conducted over the past five years revealed that 68% of Christian men and 50% of pastors view regularly. Even more shocking is that 11 to 17 year old boys reported being its greatest users. Oh, help us, Jesus. Now, the church is on a sexual battle for its life. I'm not kidding. The church. Yeah. And, you know, this stuff is real. Even if you, you might go, oh, that's not possible. Well, just because you don't think it is doesn't mean it's not true. It's real and it's happening. And you'd be very wise. There's, there's a, there's a software called covenant eyes. I know even some very close to me that have dealt with this. Um, it's the testimony of people on our staff that were used to be caught up in this and, and that God helped set them free. But one of those things is accountability. There's software that if this was ever a struggle that you can put on that other people get alerted, if anything, I mean, it, it's very cool. So there's ways to protect yourself, but this tsunami wave of destruction is, is part of the evil that's just invading our world. And it's invading our world through a good tool called the smartphone. That can be used as a dumb phone. All right. Yeah, exactly. 
The smartphone is great if you use it for good, but it's a tool that the enemy can use for evil. And how many times I've done it. Oh, my word. Especially in like a coffee shop or stuff, because it seems that in the internet of coffee shops, it somehow. Anyway, how many times have you gone on the internet and these pop-up ads come up? And if you click on the wrong thing that you yeah. don't even mean to click on and you're trying to get out of it, but you actually are going into it, it takes yeah. you and then it notices that you clicked on that. So it sends you even yeah. more. And I mean, this stuff is just bait. That's the bait of Satan to get in our hearts and our minds and our children. So remember that this thing, that this sexual sin has got to stop. We've got to begin with us. Be accountable. Don't ever let your eyes, you know, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. What is the Father up above is looking out in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see, and ears and mouth and all of it. Be careful. Those little songs we need to be singing to adults as well. Here's our last verses. There's a whole bunch of verses in a row. 29 through 35, which is the, which is the end, all talks about uh, this thing of no discipline. Who has anguish? I'm in verse 29 of Proverbs 23. Who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who is always fighting? Who is always complaining? Who has unnecessary bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? This is Solomon talking. It is the one who spends long hours in the taverns trying out new drinks. Don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is how it sparkles in the cup. Isn't this imagination? Solomon writes with great imagination. How smoothly it goes down for in the end it bites. Listen, in the end, right, underline that word or however it is. In the end, it bites like a poisonous snake. It stings like a viper. You will see hallucinations and you will say crazy things. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea, clinging to a swaying mast. And you will say, they hit me but I didn't feel it. I didn't even know it when they beat me up. When will I wake up so I can look for another drink? This is how Solomon ends verse uh, Proverbs 23. A warning to uh, everyone, a warning to you and me right now. Here it is. Wine is a mocker. There's your last writing and can destroy your life. Wine, alcohol is a mocker. And can destroy your life. Here, here is my line on this. I've heard it said many, many times. I've never heard anyone. Have you ever heard anyone testify to the fact that alcohol benefited their life? No. No. But I have heard hundreds and thousands over the years of people tell me how alcohol has destroyed their life. So people like my father never took a drink of alcohol in his life. Trump has never taken a drink of alcohol in his life. Why? Because Trump saw his brother's life ruined by alcohol. My dad never took a drink of alcohol, not because he was so godly and so right, because he saw what it did to his dad before he was saved. My grandfather drank a lot before he was saved. And he saw how it ruined things in their home. And, 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 and Liz is saying her mother never took a drink because her grandmother or grandfather, My grandfather, was an grandfather alcoholic. alcoholic. Okay. So here's the point. It's just a warning to us. Hey, 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 anything can be used in this case or same way. Any sin, porn, alcohol, pills, gambling. Oh my word. How many lives ruined by gambling, shopping, shopping, finances, credit card debt. <laughs> Anything done, not with discipline, right? So we want to pray that over ourselves as we close. I hope that you've been blessed by this today. Next next uh, week, we'll be in Proverbs 24. We'll begin at the top of Proverbs 24. Friends, I'm here to help you live by faith. And I hope you know how much I love you. I pray for you. All of my friends who watch, all the tune in from all over the country and even all over the world many times. Um, we need each other. And we need to pray for one another that we will remain strong in the faith, that we will be girded up with the armor of God. So I want to pray just a faith-filled pray or prayer over you. And let's just close our books and our Bibles and let's let's just uh, focus on the Lord. Holy, Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And I declare just a blessing prayer over my friends watching today, over my friends who are all gathered here in Burnsville, Minnesota with me. Father in heaven, we declare how much we need you. We declare how we cannot be victorious in this life without your help and your strength, your righteousness, your grace, your mercy. So today, God, we sit up straight. 
we get our mind right. We get this armor of God encompassed with this so that we will walk through this day in victory, yes. that we will walk through this day with the overcoming spirit of God that is so filled in us that it overcomes the world and overcomes the evil that's coming at us. Holy Spirit, come, fill us, fill our minds, fill our mouths, fill our homes, fill our cars, fill our churches with your glory, fill our churches with your love. God, specifically today, I pray for everyone watching and everyone here, that every place our feet walk, we bring peace. That our feet will be shod yes. with the preparation of peace, the gospel of peace, that we bring peace to every situation. We bring peace to every conversation. We bring peace and love and encouragement. God, help us to live like Jesus did. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. We live with that servant heart. Thank you, God. We live with that servant mentality that it's not about us. It's never been about us. It'll never be about us. It's about you, God. So, Lord, we bless your name. Bless America as we bless you. God, your promise is to bless America as we bless you today. Be with our nation. Be with our leaders. Be with our government. Be with our state government. Be with our governors, our senators, our congressmen. We bless them, Lord. Lord, help us to not curse them, but to pray for them and to bless them because they need your wisdom. They need to be drawn to you. They need to be to be anchored in the truth of who you are, Jesus. Thank you, God. We love you. We love you. We go forward in this day now with victory, with love and with truth. We will live by truth. Hallelujah. Amen. A couple of things as we close. Please share this. If this video has blessed you, share it. That's your gift to the Lord, your gift to me. Please share it. If you're in the Minneapolis area, join me here every Wednesday at 630, every Sunday at 930 and 6 o'clock. We'd love to have you visit. Come. If you don't have a home church, come be a part of what God's doing here at the Father's house. God bless your day. I love you so much. Bye-bye. Bravo, bravo. Amen, amen. <laughs> Woo! Amen. All right. One thing, just 30 seconds. What did the Lord talk to you about today? This, I, 